Welcome once again to um, this course, uh, Be Prepared. I was uh, thinking about the very title earlier this morning, Be Prepared, to be prepared for something. Uh, one uh, needs to be alert, to be conscious of that which is uh, going on around. Think of an army that um, is going to be invaded in um uh, in any territory, some other uh, force coming ag against them um, and they are ill prepared or uh, they are asleep, they would become a slave to that other nation. They would become bound and overcome and perhaps many lives are left, uh, lost. And uh, we obviously have created this course, uh, be prepared with that very intention that you have the material, you have the scriptures, um, and that you have this opportunity to be well advised. Even scripture many times speaks about a warning uh, of uh, people and particularly the church. And we are speaking to people who are in the church. Our scripture from uh, Matthew chapter 24 speaks about all of them were virgins and all of them fell asleep. And um, this session, session 10, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at another reason uh, why people fall asleep. And um, in this session, I'll be speaking about a disconnection, um, how people basically sign out in life. They, uh, they get disconnected in life. And, and uh, this is an issue that is a plague, uh, plaguing the entire world, the, the, uh, the, uh, the whole universe, I would say right now everybody living on the planet i would say comes under this the sway or the opportunity to get disconnect from something whether it is people whether it is meaningful relationships whether it is uh, uh, something that can actually help their life and unfortunately this is epidemic in our worlds today and uh, we see more and more through uh, media as an example as people um, uh, hold more to their phones rather than having a face-to-face -face conversation with another human beings then a disconnection sets in we think through uh, through the advent of um, media and through the internet that we actually become closer with each other but experts are saying that um, more and more people are are facing all kinds of mental issues even though they are spending a lot of time so to speak connected online in fact they a study shows that uh, between uh, a children between the ages of 12 and 17 who spend at least uh, three hours per day on the, the internet, browsing the internet, they actually are in uh, in acute danger of having health issues. And this is something that we're going to be looking at. The whole goal and this insidious crafty plan that is actually uh, being portrayed, put upon uh, mankind today is all based uh, to separate us from each other, causing uh, suspicion, anxiety, and fear as well. The goal when it comes to the church is to put the church to sleep. And hopefully these messages and these courses these uh, that you've been watching has actually helped you. There's always a checklist at the end of my messages where you can have a look and look and reflect and say, this, I, I, need, to, I need to adjust here. I need to change here. This is a blind spot. This is an area that I need to actually tighten up on. And for today, particularly, you need to be asking the questions. Am I disconnected? Do I connect well? Now, when it comes to defining the word disconnection, it's uh, as the state of being isolated or detached. One used to be attached or bound to something. One used to be part of something and suddenly you have disengaged yourself and you're no longer connected. It's the action of stopping the supply from a source. You disconnect. When you take power as an example and you pull the plug from the wall socket, you are disconnecting uh, from the power, from the source. And ultimately, as a Christian, as a believer, our source comes from God. But let me uh, define what connection is, because the opposite of disconnection is connection, connectivity. 
in um, and I think the best the best way to describe it is right back in the the very very um, uh, beginnings where God created the earths and it says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it says let us make man Adam in our image there was this connection of the father son and the holy spirit in the very creation of man it wasn't one doing his own thing one off doing another thing over on a different side it was let us collectively uh, uh, but, but, but create this human being in our own image and it is every one of us part everyone playing our part it was uh, we brought together uh, as a result of God's initiative and and we are brought into relationship with him and 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 in strong uh, uh, connection to him because there was a connection in the very very Godhead and that's very important to understand man was made to fit very well in connecting with his God uh, the God who made him, the whole purpose for man was to connect to God and stay connected because when disconnection comes between man and God, that's where all kinds of issues arise and we'll be looking at those later on. Reasons and of course what as a result of disconnection brings. If we don't connect with God, there is always uh, something missing. There is this God shaped hole within us that can never be filled. Let me make uh, two quotes here. The first one is uh, if we do not connect with God, with the one who said, Let us make man in our own image, in our own resemblance, we will connect with everything that is counterfeit and fake, not real. And this will cause us to fall asleep. We won't be awake as to knowing what is the truth. We will basically be duped into uh, um, a false understanding, a false reality. Another quote is that uh, the only meaningful relationship that you will ever have is with your creator. And it is absolutely um, important to understand. Yes, we have relationships with human beings, husbands, wives, children, friends, uh, colleagues at work or play. But the most meaningful relationship that we will ever have is with our creator. Everything flows as a result of that. And it is a blessed connection. And I want to refer to this often, a blessed connection. Unfortunately, we have religion who's up against this connection all the time. Religion will want man to sign out, in other words, out of God, preferring uh, for you to rather just have a form of godliness and deny the power. A form of godliness. You look the part, but really you aren't. You're actually fake. You're counterfeit. The real thing actually isn't evident at all. Now, let me give you the principle, what I understand, of disconnection. The principle of disconnection, I believe, is to divide, to detach, to d disconnect, and ultimately cause you to go into sleep. Let me read from Matthew, and we'll read the first scripture uh, from chapter 12. This is a situation where Jesus was confronted again by the religious from verse 22 onwards he says this then one was brought to him who was demon possessed blind and mute and he healed him so this man was in a terrible situation so that the blind mute man both spoke and saw and obviously he was in his right mind he was able to connect <laughs> And this is the thing about the demonic, that it wants to disconnect people from the reality. Verse 23, and it says, And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? So they weren't actually uh, clear on it. But here's the verse that I want to emphasize. But now the Pharisees heard it and said, This fellow doesn't cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Then Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city and house divided against itself will not stand. The principle of disconnection is dividing, 
overcoming, disconnecting, detaching each one from each other. And as a result, that house, that city, that people will not stand as a result of this. Now, here's the thing. The man who was healed, who actually spoke perhaps for the first time, he connected with Jesus. There was a connection. The multitudes who were amazed, still confused, perhaps, perhaps they longed for a connection. But the point of the matter is the leaders, those blind, asleep leaders, sought to divide the people using not this rabbi, not this teacher, not the one, the master, this fellow totally were disconnected and they wanted other people to stay absolutely separated and disconnected from the very source like Jesus and he encountered this over and over again there were two types of people there were those who connected with him and understood maybe not everything about him but understood that he had life and there were those who knew he had life because of the scriptures and they remained totally disconnected a kingdom that is divided will not stand it'll be brought down to desolation that's what that scripture says that's the principle of disconnection but let me give you the principle of connectivity or connection the principle is unity now not everybody can agree on absolutely everything but unity plays a very important part in bringing connection to givenness. It brings the blessing. Let me read from Psalm chapter 133 and verse 1 to 3. In the King James, it says, Behold, now behold means see for yourself. Examine it, be aware, be alert, be awake, see for yourself. This is very important. Behold means look, at, look closely into it. Don't be averted. Don't get distracted like we spoke about last time. But be focused on what this is saying. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that came down upon the skirts of his garment. And it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For the Lord commanded the blessing there, life forever. Let's just unpack this because this is the principle of connection. Behold, see for yourself, stay alert. If you want to be connected to something and you want to stay uh, connected, you need to be alert. It's like uh, a, a person who uh, 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 is, is running a race. He knows where exactly what lane he's supposed to be in. He, if he goes over, he's disqualified. How good, how agreeable it is, how pleasant it is when brethren come together. And again, this is speaking about the church, brethren coming together. It's pleasant, living in unity, connected with each other in harmony. This is pleasant, according to the scripture. Unpleasant, of course, would be something that is completely out of sync, out of harmony. Think about an orchestra as an example. You have many instruments. I have never uh, played or I've never even been to a show. But I know that there's, there's a lot of instruments and they know exactly where to place them. The brass over here and the flutes over there and the violins, etc. The string instruments. Everything is synced in such a way to give this beautiful harmony and this incredible sound that would come that would be pleasant. To the ears because if it wasn't if one basically did their own thing played out of tune decided today you know what i'm not going to do what is on the piece of paper what i'm directed to do i will do my own thing they they disconnect from the whole group and it will become unpleasant the conductor those who are standing in front who are leading it will pick that up straight away everyone playing everyone playing their own role the notes that is necessary. It's a pleasant sound. And then it says, God commands or decrees a blessing right there. In the midst of this unity, in the midst of connectivity, in the midst of doing life together, 
And this is what it's all about, being prepared to do life together. God commands a blessing. Again, I want to emphasize, we may not agree on absolutely everything. We may not at all. But unfortunately, today, everything, and we see this, what the experts are calling the collapse or the breakdown of togetherness. And I've read and researched a lot about this. There is this breakdown where the world is basically becoming compartmentalized and fragmented to the place where people are no longer coming together. In fact, years ago, most people actually did things together in groups communities. But unfortunately, everything today is becoming and being replaced by individualism. I can do this on my own. I want to read from this book. It's called Lost Connections. Brilliant book by Johan Harry. And I want to read something uh, that he wrote. And I mean, he writes about his mother's experience. He says, when my mother moved to Eldwich, eh, eh, sorry, Edway, <clears throat> and found that there was no community, only polite nods and closed doors, she assumed that there was something wrong with Edgewa. But it turns out that our little suburb was not unusual. This is now in London. For decades now, the Harvard professor named Robert Putman has been documenting one of the most important trends of our time. There are all sorts of ways that humans can come together to connect, to do something as a group. Sports teams, choirs, volunteer groups, just meeting up for a regular dinner. <laughs> he has been uh, gathering figures for decades about how much we do these things. And he found that they have been in free fall, less in other words. He gave an example that has become famous. Bowling is one of the most popular leisure activities in the United States. And people used to do it in organized leagues, in other words, together. They would be part of a team that competed against each other and they would mingle and get to know each other. Today, people still bowl, yes, but they do it alone. They do it alone. They're in their own lane. And that's a clear definition of disconnection. I'm in my own lane. I'm doing this at my own speed, my own way. I don't need anybody else. They're doing their own thing. The collective structure has collapsed. And he goes on and he says here, we've dropped out of community and we have completely turned inward. We are inward focused. In fact, he actually asks the question about friendships. He says, how many confidants do you have? Friends, in other words. He wanted to know how many people you could turn to in a crisis or when something really good has happened to you want to celebrate, in other words. When you started, he started doing the study several decades, decades ago, the average number of close friends in America was three three close friends. By 20, uh, 2004, the most common answer was none at all. None. I have no friends at all. And this is epidemic, unfortunately. We have turned inwards, even no longer doing things as a family. We used to watch television together as families. We used to go on vacation. Now, unfortunately, it's become less and less common in the 21st century. And this is what he says. We do things less than any other humans who came before us. We do things less together. And this is very, very, very sad. Social media, of course, has had played a, a huge role. I'm reading another book and I haven't uh, really, I've just started. It's called Disconnected as well. These are good materials. And she speaks about her role in getting her life back and weaned off the internet. And unfortunately, as a result of social media that we think has linked us together, higher levels of loneliness, anxiety, depression seems to be on the increase. In fact, experts say that we now have no and forgotten how to interact and how to communicate at the most basic level face 
to face. We look down rather than look up. We'd rather look at our phone than look in the face of another human being. And this is all about disconnection. <clears throat> Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Ta Talking to Strangers, and let me just show you the cover. Again, brilliant. I like this author as well. Brilliant, brilliant book about how we've lost the art of being able to talk to another person. He actually says this, that he writes about a study that they did amongst circuit judges in New York. And that the study was done on those judges who um, needed to make decisions on uh, perpetrators, people that they would consider have actually committed a crime without being able to see them face to face. It was done virtually. In other words, it was he, they heard the testimony, they saw the data on pieces of paper, but they never were given the opportunity to see the actual person face to face. They couldn't read their facial expressions when asked the question. They weren't able <clears throat> to ascertain whether the person was telling a, 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 a truth when something was posed to them. They were not able to see them face to face. This is the situation. In other words, they were disconnected from the person. All they saw was a testimony written down. They read it and they had to make an assumption and they had to make a decision. Is this person guilty? Is he not guilty? Is he have, does he have uh, uh, the ability to recommit this crime again? And the study is stark. And it says that over, over 48 point three percent of those judgments were incorrect incorrect because they could not see the person they were completely disconnected incorrect the evidence is everywhere and it's creeping unfortunately into the church as well it's easy to do church online very much it's much more difficult to actually face someone and have a conversation a meaningful conversation because we've lost that as well in other words, the goal is to cause people to disconnect more and more and not be staying sharp or balanced. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says this, As iron <coughs> sharpens iron, so a man sharpens another. The passion says it sharpens his character. This cannot be done online. It cannot be done virtually. We need each other to keep ourselves sharp. We need each other to stay connected with each other so that we will stay awake. Now, here's the question. Who's behind it all? Who's behind this disconnection? And of course, we know who's behind it. The one who has always sought to disconnect us from the life source, to bring division, to bring divide. It's the accuser of the brethren. That is exactly his plan. In fact, the word devil actually can be translated in Greek to mean divide, to be the one who separates and the one who slanders. He's the one who was in the garden bringing division between husband, wife, between man and God. Right there, he was bringing division. And remember the very, very first question that was asked of man. Most people won't be able to answer that. It's in Genesis. It's the very first question that God answers. Where are you, man? Adam is, means man. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where have you? Why have you dis appeared why have you disconnected from me why are you hiding away where are you and the enemy caused this and we need to ask the same question of our own lives does God crying out asking where are you why can I not know why are you not with me why are you no longer connected to me there are times of course in history where men have come together collectively to fight and connect with each other so that they can overcome something. Like, for instance, the overcoming of Nazism. Yes, it was a very good thing for people to come together. 
But there are things in history that have also caused us to be divided as well. We think of this pandemic that has divided households, husbands, wives, and they no longer can actually feel that they can sit around a table without this this atmosphere of of hurt and, and misunderstanding. They cannot because of that pandemic that has disconnected people. They become divided. They become dysfunctional. And of course, the Bible actually clearly, clearly puts it right at the feet of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says this, that we take our stand against the devil's schemes. One of his schemes and his ultimate schemes, not just lying to us, but to bring us into disconnection. We're not struggling against man we're struggling against a force that's behind that that is bringing these dis- divisions ultimately causing us to fall asleep this has been his plan all along and it's his long-term plan if i can keep people separated if i can keep them uh, discontent and disconnected because that he knows that when you get together and there is unity particularly in the church when there's unity and purpose then his kingdom is bruised exactly what was prophesied amos chapter 3 verse 3 says this do to walk together unless they agree can they will they <clears throat> no unless there is an agreement unless there is a connection. You can't walk together with someone unless there's an agreement and a connection. Yes, it can be fake. Of course, we can camouflage things. Of course, we can hide really the real truth behind everything. Of course, we can hide the fact that I don't really like being with this person. I don't really, but I have to, so to speak. We can comma, we can, we can do those type of things. But the, 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 the bottom line is, is that we are disconnected and no life will flow from it. Enmity is the word that was spoken in Genesis chapter 3, 3 verse 15. I will bring enmity between the man and uh, his seed and I will bring enmity between Satan and, 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 and man. And enmity is what causes absolute divisions. As I say, he is the one who's behind every dispute. He's the one behind families, tribes, nations, one setting up one against the other. So who's behind it? The question, who's behind it? We know we place this right at the feet of the enemy because he does not want us to connect with one another. Now I'm going to going to go into this next section of this session on where we start looking at what causes disconnection that ultimately results in sleep because that's what this course is all about why are you asleep causes and there'll be quite a number of these causes the first one i would say is loss and of course there are many reasons why people disconnect, but I've chosen a number and I've, and I've, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm giving you. The first one is loss, the loss of a job, as an example, uh, loss of, of a, a meaningful relationship, uh, loss of a, a family member, uh, not just uh, if they're in death, but perhaps they distant, they far away, they no longer talk to you or they no longer uh, uh, see you as part of their, 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 uh, uh, their, their part of your, their network, so to speak. And there comes loss and you feel disconnected because of that. Um, I've seen how nations who emigrate to another country like South Africans come to, to the United Kingdom and they constantly try and, and buy, they buy South African products, they get together in South African groups, they, they enjoy their company, we speak the same language, we, we share the same jokes, we laugh about the same things, etc. And they feel a, a sense of community, but there is still a sense of loss. Because if you look at really at it, that, at their lives, they're talking often about, you know, the days when we were there, and there's a sense of loss. We disconnected from that nation. We're no longer there. And yet there's still that longing to be back there. There is a loss of purpose. In other words, a loss of meaning. I have no more use in my life. I'm no longer needed. In other words, if I were not here, I really wouldn't be missed. No one would even know that I'm not around. 
I wouldn't be missed at all. And that is a terrible thing. I mean, basic human needs is that people everywhere, no matter where they are, they must feel that they need it. That if they're not there, there's something missing. There is something, we, where's Jack? Where's Jane? Where, where's that part that is actually missing? And scripture talks about how every single part, and when one part is disjointed, no longer connected, think about your shoulder as an example. If your shoulder gets disconnected, and it's out of sync, and it lies flopping basically on the side, there's going to be tremendous pain, discomfort, that will, and that area will become inflamed, and your whole body, every part of your body, this side, that side, your leg, everything will know something has been disconnected. And as soon as it gets back in place, and it gets healed, and it functions correctly, there is joy, and there is pleasantness, and it's good, as we read in Psalm 133. So a loss of purpose, a loss of meaning, I'm no longer needed, that can cause tremendous disconnection because what happens is people get convinced that I'm not needed. So what do I do is I back off and I disconnect further. Instead of me pushing in and finding my purpose and finding my meaning and finding my place, I pull back and I let somebody else take over and I disconnect further and further. Another thing that causes loss is there is there's just no vision and this loss actually creates no vision listen to what uh, proverbs 29 verse 18 it says when there is no clear prophetic vision people including people in the church quickly wander astray they cast off restraints the king james says and it is really a clear picture of the world today but it also could be a clear picture of the church no oil no, no vision, no prophetic vision, no pressing into what God actually has for me, what he wants me to do, what he wants, he expects of me. And as a result, I feel this loss and it's very burdensome for a person to feel loss. And as a result, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know how to uh, connect any longer. So I just get disconnect. I become comfortable with my disconnection. The second cause I believe that causes disconnection is change or no change change or no change sudden changes in lifestyle a place where you live you used to go here I've, I've met people who spent all their life in one particular town and they had to move economically as an ex for economic reasons and suddenly they're no longer connected to that place of familiarity and this massive change that comes over their lives is is daunting they say that when men go through a certain uh, uh, period in their life and women as well and so many changes are happening in their life they feel overwhelmed by it and because they don't know and understand or can't find help you know what the best thing for me to do is i'll pull back i'll disconnect i'll fall asleep also no change this is another very important understanding as well when there is no change in other words you just feel stuck these writers of these books speak about how people just go through the motions every single day and this causes loneliness this causes a disconnection in such a way where you just there's just nothing looking bright on the horizon. I've got nothing to look forward to as an example. And no change can bring a person to obviously uh, despair. So I, I disconnect further and further and further because guess what? Nothing's really going to change. Nothing's going to change. The very first negative the Bible actually records is again from God where he turns around to the Godhead who has made, you know, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says these words, it's not good that man be alone. Everyone needs a family. Everyone needs to feel belonging. Everyone needs to ask the question of, and the serious questions. Am I disconnected? Do I not have meaningful relationships? I actually asked the question, when was the, the last time that you had a full, meaningful conversation with another human being? 
And people, you pick up on certain things. I'm a good communicator and I like to speak to people. I go out of my way to try and be interested in that person. I look them in the eye. I shake their hand. I hold their hand. And when I communicate to them, I speak directly to their face. I don't look away. I don't look down. I look straight at their face. Then they know that I'm interested in them. So that I know I can have a meaningful conversation and they know someone's having a meaningful conversation with me. And boom, there's a connection. There's a connection. Experts say that uh, when we cannot have a meaningful conversation, what this results, depression and serious mental health issues can set in as well. Being stuck in something, feeling there is just no outlet will cause many complications to arise. And people would rather just go to sleep. I'd rather just lay down and not try and change anything. Let me just push everything under the carpet. You know that term. If I hide it away and when Adam hid from God, he was basically using whatever happened to him to disconnect him from God. He should have run to God. When the Lord came into the God, you should have run to him and fell down and say, Lord, I'm sorry, this has happened, etc. But he hid away. He disconnected. Another point about causes of disconnection is disappointment and the fear of missing out. Let me, let me deal with those two things. Disappointment. And unfortunately, the world uh, is constantly... Um, speaking about how we need to attain a certain level. We need to look a certain part. We need to drive a certain car. We need to live in a certain neighborhood. We need to do this. We need to do. They basically measured out and meted out for us what we should be doing and what we should look like. And when we don't get to that place, when we don't rise up or we don't attain that so-called thing, then disappointment can actually set in. And then people just give up. They say, well, you know what? I remember, uh, uh, this runner um, in the, the Olympic Games, uh, I, I forget his name, is Abrahams. I remember in the film, The Chariots of Fire, he ran against um, Eric Little, who was a, a runner as well, a Scottish runner who became a missionary. And his name, and, and, and he came third or he came second. And he's sitting in the stands and his girlfriend is saying, said to, her, said to him, Mr. Abrahams, you, you, yes, you lost a race. But you, you can't sign out in life. He said, well, if I can't, if, if, I, if I can't win, I can't run. And she said this. She said, if you can't, you can't. She said, I won't, she said, I won't run if I don't win. And she said, well, you can't win if you don't run. And this is the problem. People have signed out in life because of disappointment. And they have also this understanding that I'm missing out on something. You know, today there is just so much stimuli where we, we, we get so much from uh, the, the media and so much from our phones, etc. And we respond to this over, over uh, emphasis of stimuli from, from our media. And we have this real concern that I'm missing out on something. I really am. You know, this is interesting. The founder of Facebook admitted that the, uh, that the social network was not designed to unite us, but to distract us. Wow. I would say it wasn't designed to connect us, but rather to disconnect us. And we get this unhealthy attitude and this dissatisfaction in life, dissatisfaction in life that we feel that we're overlooked we feel disappointed and, and that, that no one's noticing me, so to speak. We feel that someone has got a better deal than I have. Someone is having more fun somewhere else than I am. Someone's got the, a, a greener grass, so to speak, etc. And as a result, we, we get disappointed. And as a result of disappointment, we, get a, we sit back and we disconnect. And we grow suspicious. This is another point about causes of disconnection. We grow suspicious. One who pre pre pulls back rather than presses in. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 says. The scripture says, Now the just shall live by faith. They shall live awakened. They shan't live asleep. 
but anyone who draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And in verse 39 of that same chapter, it says, but we are not those who draw back. We are not those who shrink back. We are not those who remain asleep. We will not be suspicious of the Lord. We will not push. We will not sh shrink back at all. But we will stay connected in faith because it says the just live by faith and we stay awake. Let me give you uh, an example of suspicion in the scripture. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter um, 18 and I'm going to read a number of verses. Now, <clears throat> when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. In other words, there was this connection between David and Jonathan. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, a connection, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off a robe, gave him gifts. Jonathan took off his armor and his sword and his bow and even his belt and gave them to David in connection. He made a covenant with him. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So Saul's servants, Saul's people, Saul's army all accepted this young man who connected. He was a man who connected wherever he went. Verse 6, and it says, Now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the woman came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing and meeting the king Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the woman sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Now listen to the progression, right? Great joy. Instead of being joyful about the actual uh, overcoming the enemy, this is what happens to Saul. Saul was very angry and displeased. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands and only to me one thousand and thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? And from that day onwards, he eyed David with suspicion. With suspicion. Suspicion caused disconnection right there and then. In other words, David, as I said, was connected. He wasn't suspicious of uh, uh, Jonathan, sorry, wasn't suspicious of David. However, unfortunately, his father. His father's servants weren't suspicious. His father's men, the women were not. All the people saw David as a man who delivered Israel, the greater good. But Saul thought, you know what? He's going to take my kingdom away. And suspicion and resentment and anger all sets in, will create disconnection. Another aspect I believe that happens is that we then get disconnected from the call of God. Exactly what happened to Saul. Very, very thing happened to him when he became suspicious, when he became angry and discontent with this young man. He lost his call and he got disconnected from that very call. If God has called you to slay thousands and God has called your brother to slay ten thousands. The one who slays ten and the one who slays one should rejoice together and make covenant and be connected. Unfortunately, the accuser gets in and divides us. And that's happening all the time. You get disconnected from my call. The Bible actually clearly says when it comes to winning, over another person, that you are wise when you do that. Let me talk a little about, again, about two different people. You can also read this in 1 Samuel chapter 2. For time, we're not going to read all the scriptures. But there are two people that I want to actually focus on right now. The one is the priest, Elijah, and the young man, Samuel. 
Now, if you read in the scripture, it says there that Eli, Eli was a judge or a, a, a priest for 40 years, a priest and a judge over Israel. It also says that he was a man of excess. He was very heavy. In other words, he was not able to hold himself. He would basically get excessive. He had two sons, Phineas and Hophni. And the word actually says that they were very corrupt. In fact, they were so corrupt that they used their position to abuse women, particularly sexually, when those women came to offer sacrifices to the Lord. They didn't listen to their father, but worse was their father would not correct them. He was too weak, he was too old, so to speak, and he lacked courage altogether. And as a result, instead of connecting to his call as a judge, he let that slip altogether. He was disconnected from his call and from the people and from the Lord altogether. Because you read about that in the scriptures as well. But then it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 18, But Samuel ministered before the Lord. Even as a child, he had a sense of call upon his life. And when Samuel stuck to his call, connected to God, when it came time to confront the king, Saul, he didn't hold back. He could have turned around and said, well, he's king. It's not my place. He did not hold back when it came to confrontation. And this is the thing about disconnecting from the call of God. Two examples, Eli and Samuel, both of them used by the Lord, but one disconnected from the Lord and disconnected from his call. And unfortunately, he died a terrible death and so did both his sons. Samuel went on to do glorious things from the Lord, for the Lord. As a result, again, of this disconnection, we get disconnected from the power of God. I still marvel when I'm in meetings where I see the move of God and the move of the Spirit. And there are people around folding their arms, chatting to one another about the, the, the game that happened last night or what's on, on, on the menu for our Sunday lunch, so to speak. And, and God's right there in their midst, pouring out His love and His generous blessing. And they are completely disconnected as well. I remember I was in a leaders meeting. I'd just come back from a, 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 a period of tremendous revival meetings and the, the, uh, I was a, a, a leader in the church and the, the senior leader said, you know, let's go to this conference together and I want you to share with all these pastors what happened. And I did. I got up, I shared and I, I was hoping the Holy Spirit would start touching people. The man who was conducting the, the, the conference, etc., stood up afterwards. And I never forget the words that he actually said. That's all good, he said. That's fine. But however, I would rather spend time with my wife. He meant intimately. He did almost gave a sexual innuendo, so to speak. I'd rather be doing that than going off and having revival meetings, meeting with God. In other words, uh, connecting with the power of God. And he disconnected altogether. Unfortunately, not long after that, his wife left him. Leviticus 6 verse 12 says this. This is a stark reality. Uh, sorry, stark scripture. It says, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. It shall not be put out. The priests shall feed the fire. We are called the royal priesthood. That's what the scripture says. In, in Revelation 5.10, it says, God has made us both king, a kingdom and priests to serve him. And we cannot disconnect from the power of God. In the natural, one has a, if you look at a fire, if you take one of the coals out of that and you disconnect it from the actual source of that fire, very quickly it will go out. Another area is, I believe, is pure stubbornness. People are stubborn. They stiff-necked according to Scripture. They are immovable, so to speak. And as a result of that, disconnection comes into their lives. Stephen was about to be killed. We know that in um, Acts chapter 7. And he says these words to Israel and the leaders. And again, these could be leaders in the church. It says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. 
and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. What a horrible thing to say. You resisted him. And it is a clear indication that these people, these leaders, disconnected. They wanted to do away with Stephen. They wanted to shut their ears, so to speak. And they had disconnected from the word of the Lord. And they disconnected because of their stubbornness. They would not. And they refused to receive from Stephen. Listen to what Proverbs 12 verse 1 says. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof or discipline is stupid. Jeremiah 17 verse 23 says, They did not listen, but were stiff-necked in their necks. They were stiff-necked in their necks. That they may not hear and receive any instruction. This should not be any of us. We should be receiving the instruction. Otherwise, we will disconnect and we will fall asleep. And then our hearts become completely disconnected as well from the Father's purpose, from His values, from the Word, from the Spirit of the Lord. And Jesus is our very best example of how He was connected to the Father. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, He says, I must be about my Father's business. John 10, verse 32 says, Many good works I have shown you, from my father there could be no separation between the son and the father however today people are completely completely asleep because of the workings of the father and a heart that gets disconnected is like uh, it's yes it functions it's a an organ that keeps pumping oxygen and keeps pumping blood but we're talking about a heart after him and it is a heart issue Listen to what Matthew chapter 15 verse 6. And this is unfortunately a serious, serious matter. If your heart is disconnected, you become hollow, empty, a shallow. You become emaciated altogether in your spirit. Matthew 15 verse 6. You have made the commandments of God to be of no effect. You are a people who draw near to me with your mouth, honoring me with your lips, but Your heart is far from me. In other words, we lift our hands or we make play lip service to him, so to speak. But our hearts are completely far. When it's far away, it's disconnected. It's disconnected. Religious people are the very best example of this. A people that are disconnected and they will become dull and ultimately they will come asleep. We call it a a cold heart. Anything goes, unfortunately. When a heart is so disconnected, when it becomes callous and cold, anything goes. In other words, what God will look after. We, you know, we can we can do whatever is necessary. I I recall a, a serious situation. I had a conversation with this lady that I knew, and she said to me, "You know what?" And she was quite promiscuous, and she said to me, "You know, I can't stop my promiscuity." I said, "You can." By the power of the, the Spirit of God, you can. No, I love doing this, etc. And you know what? After, after I've done it, I, I just pray and ask God to forgive me and His grace covers me. What do you say to a thing like that? That is a cold heart. Listen to what Jeremiah 48 verse 10 says. It says, Cursed is the one who does the work of the Lord with laziness or slackness, neglecting to honor His name neglecting to honor his cause his mission is like done from a cold heart an attitude that as i say you know what i won't give my best i won't do an excellent job i'll basically do a laxy daisy job and you know what i have met hundreds and hundreds of christians like that god will be fine with this god will take that's fine etc etc i want to give you a story that happened for me in Bible school, and I won't mention names. When I was in Bible school, we had a student there that uh, he constantly uh, uh, was re- in rebellion against uh, the teaching, the te- the 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 situa- the, 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 the the roster. Uh, when the, we had to work, he wasn't there. When 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 there was something to, he had he had this complaint attitude all the time we came to the end of the year when we were about to graduate it was the last week the last week of graduation 
graduation, where you're about to get your certificate. He'd gone through the whole year doing this. And I mean, he'd constantly kicked against the pricks. He constantly, you know, uh, fought against the system and made the teachers' lives miserable. The last week, we're having a, a, a meal and we used to have a, a, a roster where the students would clean the dishes. And there was quite a lot of work involved as a result of that. And I remember there was a holiday. So as a result, they just moved the roster along. The person who was not going to be there moved it along. And it happened to be this person. He thought he was going to get away of doing the dishes because it was a holiday. And the teacher who was in charge said, no, 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 you're doing it. We're just pushing. And he had this massive argument, a massive argument with the teacher. It then went to the principal and it continued to the place where he packed his bags and he walked out the door. I met him many years ago, later after that, and he hadn't graduated and he hadn't moved on from that stubborn, cold heartedness within inside of him. He wasn't able to be touched at all. Listen to what Psalm 119 verse 70 says this. The heart that is insensitive, cold, in other words, their hearts, their minds are dull and brutal. I it goes on and it says that they, they, they will return to nothing. But I delight in your law. I delight in your word. It will keep me from being dull. It will keep me from being insensitive. And I will be completely connected to that. Unfortunately, as I was talking about that story of that, that uh, student that I mentioned, the arrogance that actually uh, was created in this person was overwhelming and he affected many, many people because this is what happens to a person who becomes discontent. They become uh, uh, disconnected themselves and they want a party. They want other people to actually join their party. And I remember there was another student that he was close to and he constantly tried to actually influence this person. Why? Because his heart was cold. And you need to be aware of these people who will try and creep into your life. People who will try and disconnect you. Those who already have a cold heart. Do not allow them to influence your life. Uh, another area of, um, uh, I would say, a cause of, of disconnecting is uh, those who become ignoring of that which is the Spirit of God. The move of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, Never grieve the Spirit. I think one of the ways that we could grieve anybody in life is to ignore them. The only thing I want to ignore in my life is the devil. I am alert and I'm aware to what he tries to do, but I won't pay him any homage. I won't pay him any glory or whatever. But the Spirit of God is a completely different thing altogether. We mustn't take in any way, according to scripture, anything uh, for granted when it comes to him. When it comes to his influence in my life, let's not take it for granted. And when we ignore his dealings, when we ignore um, his disciplines and his word, we become very, very quickly disconnected. If he's, uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 says, never restrain or put out the fire or reduce or quench the Holy Spirit. Don't reduce the Holy Spirit in your life. You will dry up like a prune. And you'll become completely disconnected, dry, lifeless, because He is the living water, and He wants to pour it out upon the thirsty. And unfortunately, many of these things uh, that we spoke, these causes create a not just a cold heart, but a orphaned heart as well, where you feel that you are abandoned. Abandonment is a terrible feeling altogether. And we need to fight against feeling abandoned, that God doesn't love us, that God won't accept us. We need to be the ones who adopt the spirit of sonship. We need to be the ones who cry out Abba all the time, Abba Father. And unfortunately, the sense of, of abandonment very, very quickly can set into a person and they can feel completely disconnected altogether. We need to learn and fall in love with the Father's love. 
and receive his affirmation, receive his pleasure, receive his grace. Unfortunately, we know there's a lot of jealousy amongst brothers. We do know that. But when we concentrate upon the Father and his love, we will stay connected to him. And here's the thing about uh, reasons, I would say, that people get disconnected. Or not just reasons, but excuses. We've looked at the checklist of, of causes, but then there's reasons behind it. They give these reasons. I think one of the reasons, honestly, is everything concentrated on me. Self. I'm in love with myself and I don't need anybody at all. I can do this literally on my own. That's why uh, people get to the place where they say, you know what, I'm done with people, I don't trust anybody, etc., etc. And that is a call, uh, as a, 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 an excuse rather than uh, a, a, a desire to actually connect with someone. It's an excuse altogether. One to, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 2 says this, Men will be lovers of themselves. It's all about me. They have this, this form of godliness, as I said right in the beginning of the course. Uh, they have this, uh, they look the plot, they, they, part, they, they play the game, so to speak, but they deny the power altogether because they concentrate constantly upon themselves. And it's power that can transform them. It's power that can change them. It's power that can set them free. And it's power that can connect them back to God again. They, again, another reason or, or, or excuse is uh, they rest on their own achievements, so to speak. They look at what they have done. And again, it is it ties into the first point. It's all about self. Uh, there's a, a lack of humility. I remember uh, when I was a very young Christian, I wasn't long born again at all. My mom uh, took me to her see her uh, home group leader and she went there for prayer. She was battling, particularly financially. She went there asking for help. And I remember the arrogance of this man who, who was saying, well, I'm blessed. I've got this. I have this. And, and he was just so arrogant that he wasn't able to minister to my. And he was resting upon his own righteous achievements, so to speak. You know, righteous means, righteousness means I'm doing the right things. But listen to Romans chapter 10, verse 3. It says, not knowing God's righteousness, they seek to establish their own. Their own righteousness. That's what they try to do. I'm doing this and this is my reason that I'm actually doing it. And they have this idea that God will accept that. But they are disconnected from the righteousness that only comes in Christ. But here's the thing. Does The other thing that they use as an excuse is that excuse me, they fall to a place where they are convinced that my life is over and God doesn't actually need me anymore. <coughs> I'm done. I'm disconnected from God altogether. My call, etc. I'm done. I'm finished. And it's interesting that Elijah and Jonah used the same phrase. I'm done. Even after great victory, I'm done. I'm through. Just take my life. Unfortunately, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 1 First uh, Kings, it says there in verse five, it says he lay down under a broom tree and he slept, fell asleep. Take my life. And he falls asleep. What's the answer? And I'm going to be st uh, starting to bring this to a conclusion. What's the answer? What's the answer to get connected again? Community. Listen to what Psalm 86 verse 11 says. Unite my heart. Bring it back together, Lord. It's got to be a work of the Spirit. And that can be done often in community. A group of people who hold to the same attitudes, interests, moving in the same direction. You can connect again to a community. We call it the church. Another answer is we have to live in truth. We have to be absolutely honest with each other. Let me read uh, 3 John chapter 2. It's only one chapter, but it, verse 2 it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, 
even as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in truth. Listen to this. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. That's the answer. Walk in truth. Be truthful. Live in truth. Be honest with yourself. Learn from each other. Iron sharpens iron. Be of one spirit, one mind. Listen to what first, uh, Philippians two verse one uh, to verse uh, and and two verse chapter two, yeah verse one and two. Therefore, there is uh, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort in love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minding minded, having the same love, being in one accord of one mind be in one accord of one mind. Now I want to read a portion of scripture because one of the most important ways, one of the answers is, as I said, the Spirit of God can actually reconnect you. Listen to what it says in Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones, and they were disconnected. Then he caused me to pass by them around, and behold, there were very many. Indeed, it was very, very dry. And he said, Son of man, can these bones live? Can they come back together again? I answered, Lord, only you know. Again he said, prophesy to the bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You want to be connected again, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to those bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put sinews, I will bring flesh, I'll cover you with skin and I'll put breath in you and you shall live. And then the Lord said to me, prophesy, I command you to prophesy. And there was a noise, a sudden rattling and the bones came together. They got connected again by the Spirit of God, flesh upon flesh. And they came together, but there was no breath in them. They were still not living. And he said, prophesy to the breath, son of man, say, thus says the Lord, come come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these that they may come alive. And I prophesied and breath came into them and they lived and they stood upon their feet. This is the thing. What's the answer? The Spirit of God. It's the community. It's living in truth. It's being one of one mind and one spirit and saying, Lord, prophesy, speak into my disconnected life, speak into my dryness, speak into my bones, speak into my very life, Lord God, that I may come alive, that I may come awake. I am asleep. You have to ask these hard questions, brothers and sisters. Am I disconnected? Do I rely on media, social media to connect me? Have I much too much time, you know, spent on media rather than with an actual person? Am I stuck in a place that I need to get out? Johan Hari in his book, this book, The Lost Lost Connections, he actually speaks about how 40% of our time is spent at work. And if we don't have meaningful relationships and we have no meaningful purpose in there, then we will be disconnected. We cannot connect. If, can I not connect to other people? In other words, can I not speak to them? And as I said earlier on, disconnection will bring absolute loneliness. You know, and it's not about just being in the room of full of people. You can be in a crowded room and feel totally lonely. It's like what he says in his book. It's a sense that you're not sharing anything that matters with anyone else. Is that how you actually feel? And this comes all because of disconnection. And there is a way out. There is a way forward. What steps do I need to make to actually reconnect? You don't want to hear, brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord saying, where are you? You want to, if you are disconnected, hear the word of the Lord, live. And I pray that 
as you go through these courses that you will do this checklist and you, the, the result will be that you actually come awake and you become fully connected.